Um, today is the uh, 75th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. And uh, we at the National World War II Museum thought we would uh, uh, stage a, a kind of a special program for you today. We call it a museum roundtable. We often call upon our friends all over the country, and we, we are fortunate in having a lot of them. But we, we also have a, a lot of, of really good people who work at the museum, and we thought we'd uh, put some of them today in, in, on this program. And, have them address various aspects of, uh, of how to remember this event. So um, as I look around at the, my screens, I have the Brady Bunch screen right now, but I think you're probably just seeing me. Um, we have um, Larry DeCures, who is the curator at the museum. Larry, welcome. We have Dr. Ed Lengel, who is the Senior Director of Programming at the National World War II Museum, and my colleague, Ed, welcome. And um, last but not least, of course, we have Dr. Kristen Burton, who is the teacher programs and curriculum specialist in our, uh, in our media and education center at the museum. So welcome to all of you. Um, as you can probably tell, we have a historian. That's Ed is going to talk about the sort of the deep historical impact and, and, and significance here. Uh, Larry will be talking about the, the artifacts and some of the, 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 the physical uh, uh, pieces of, of the Hiroshima event and the nuclear event that we have at the museum. Kristen then will be dealing with uh, perhaps strategies about how to teach this very, very difficult material. I, I've been on the university level my, my whole life and I, I do know that this is always going to be an interesting day uh, in class when you start talking about the nuclear weapons, the end game of World War II in the Pacific. So um, with that, if I can kick things over to my colleague, Dr. Ed Lengel, who is going to talk about the history of the Hiroshima event. Ed, it's all yours. Thank you, Rob. Welcome everybody. I think it's important as we commemorate this important day to take a look at the context of the dropping of the atomic bomb, the little boy atomic bomb over Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. So I'd like to take a step back for a moment and recall that what happened in 1945 was an outgrowth of events that had taken place many years before. In 1938, Dr. Otto Hahn divided the uranium-238 atom at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin for the first time. And it was his colleague, Lisa Meitner, who you see here along with Otto Frisch, who uncovered the significance of that discovery. And from that moment, really, the race was on to acquire atomic weapons. Uh, it was a race that was undertaken all over the world, really, from Europe, primarily in Europe, but also in North America and Asia. The concern that Nazi Germany, and after all this initial discovery had been made in Berlin, in Nazi Germany, the concern that Nazi Germany would take the lead in this research and potentially acquire atomic weapons before anybody else inspired uh, important scientists who we'll see it many times throughout this process, Leo Szilard, to appeal to Albert Einstein, who was living on Long Island at the time, to work with him to write a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt urging the Americans to jump into the atomic weapons race as quickly as possible in order to ensure that whether the United States or another Western nation would acquire these weapons if they could be built before Nazi Germany could. The whole idea that Adolf Hitler could have at his beck and call uh, weapons of this magnitude was terrifying. And of course, uh, many of those scientists, the most leading scientists in nuclear physics in the United States and Europe were of Jewish ancestry. They understood what the Nazis had been doing in Germany and in other occupied parts of Europe, and they sensed all too well where that was headed. And if Hitler could acquire these weapons before anybody else, then it would be a world disaster truly of epic proportions. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt did uh, give, his, give his support to the initiations of an atomic weapons program in the United States after receiving this letter, but it was really very slow in America for the first couple of years, the first few years really, up to 1941. The American weapons program was entangled in bureaucratic delays and inertia, a 
a lack of a sense of urgency. And uh, truthfully, Germany having, having an atomic weapons program, Japan had an atomic weapons program, France had an atomic weapons program, surged ahead of the United States. Uh, and by 1941, the United States really had very little to show for uh, President Roosevelt's efforts. It's important to emphasize the British role in this. Uh, the British, uh, with a number of scientists uh, working in Birmingham and in other parts of the UK, had made a number of very important discoveries in atomic weapons in 1940 and 1941. And it was Winston Churchill's understanding of the importance of these discoveries and his pressure on the Americans to take up the uh, mantle of atomic weapons research, understanding that the Americans had the industrial power, the economic resources that Great Britain just didn't have. That, that formed really the, the, the fundamental glue of the atomic weapons program. It was British expertise that was given to the Americans in 1941 and 1942 that really got the atomic weapons program off the ground. Enrico Fermi's first chain reaction uh, discovery at the University of Chicago in 1942 really began the, the full-fledged research and the full-fledged work on what came to be called the Manhattan Project. That project came to cost, and this was in uh, contemporary money, two billion dollars. It was an astonishingly expensive program. It was one that only the Americans could have undertaken. And we have to keep in mind, again, all through this time, 1942, 1943, 1944, while scientists are working at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, at Hanford, Washington, in Canada, and of course at Los Alamos, they had no way of knowing that the German atomic weapons program had foundered to some degree in 1942. For all they knew, the Germans were working at a breakneck speed to acquire atomic weapons, as were the Japanese, as, as well as they could. And there was a deep concern. Again, it was not simply the desire to acquire power, but it was a, the really great fear that the Germans or the Japanese would acquire that power first that was, uh, that was fundamental to their drive. And of course, we now know that the American Atomic Weapons Program, through the British actually, Klaus Fuchs, uh, as you see here, infiltrated the British Atomic Weapons Program first, then was brought over to Los Alamos in 1944. And he would be key, along with a number of other spies, uh, of uh, sending that information to the Soviets. Uh, the, although security at Los Alamos was extremely tight, uh, nevertheless, the people who were carrying out the security precautions and the scientists themselves were very amateurish when it came to, to understanding uh, the dangers of espionage. So now, as we know, the Soviets would acquire much of that knowledge much more quickly than the Americans realized. At the same time that the work uh, of the scientists was going on, we can't forget, we can't neglect the work of American airmen, and particularly Lieutenant Colonel, and then, and then Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who you see here. His work of the 509th Composite Group based at Wendover Airfield in Utah, uh, carrying out the first training missions of understanding how to deploy atomic weapons. And really, although several countries were working to acquire atomic weapons, the United States was the only country with the capacity to deliver atomic weapons at long range, thanks to the B-29 Super Fortress, uh, which uh, this aircraft, the design and the efforts to make it operable is a long, long story we don't have time to get into here, but there was an awful lot of work that went into it. By 1945, in the spring and summer of 1945, American scientists and military leaders understood that they were quickly approaching the capacity to deliver atomic weapons, uh, most likely against Japan. Although it's quite clear that President uh, Roosevelt, had he survived uh, past April 12th, uh, if Germany had still been in the war, I have this from my friend, uh, Paul Sparrow, who runs the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. Roosevelt would not have hesitated to use this bomb against Germany if the situation had called for it, and he would not have hesitated to use it against Japan. 
of course, it came down to President Harry Truman to make that decision. But scientists like Leo Szilard, who you see here, some of them were deeply concerned about the long-term aftermath of using atomic weapons, partly about the morality of using them in the first place, but Zillard and others argued that it would be essential for the Americans and for the British to share their knowledge of atomic weapons with the Soviets uh, before the Soviets had to, had to work this out for themselves in the hopes of um, heading off any Cold War or atomic weapons race after the war. Uh, Zillar's attempts to approach Winston Churchill, to, to approach Roosevelt, and then Truman were all blocked, although Churchill did agree to meet with him. Uh, and the Americans and uh, General Leslie Groves, who headed the Atomic Weapons Project, assumed that it would take a long, long time for the Soviets to acquire this knowledge, and that it was up to the Americans simply to take the lead and to deploy these weapons. Of course, there was a great deal of concern leading up to August 6th about whether to deploy the atomic weapons. Uh, the little boy weapon, which was a gun type uranium-235 uh, bomb device, as well as Fat Man, which was a plutonium-based implosion design bomb, would later be used against Nagasaki. There was a great deal of debate about how and if so, whether to use them. Uh, I find it interesting and ironic that most scientists, including Robert Oppenheimer, argued that the bomb should be used against Japan without warning on a Japanese urban target, uh, one that would have some military target within the city, but nevertheless with the full understanding that the impact would be on the city. And it was often the uh, military leaders, uh, including General Hap Arnold uh, and many others who argued, well, maybe we don't need to use atomic weapons. Maybe we can continue our conventional bombing campaign, which of course had in its firebombing of Tokyo and many other cities in Japan already cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Once the decision was made, and it was ultimately Truman's with the full support of his scientists and then eventually the support of General George C. Marshall and most military leaders, once the decision was made to use atomic weapons against Japan, the question came to be where those atomic weapons would be used. Uh, and uh, Truman appointed a target committee that went through a number of different options. Pretty quickly, Hiroshima rose to the top with Nagasaki being a distant third. Hiroshima had not been hit with most of the uh, conventional bombing raids up to this point. Uh, it was a city of uh, approximately 260,000 uh, population, if I recall properly. Colonel Tibbets uh, and his B-29 Enola Gay were designated to drop the little boy atomic bomb over Hiroshima. On August 16th, and pardon me, on August 6th at 8.15 local time, from 31,000 feet, the Enola Gay, escorted by other B-29s, dropped the little boy atomic device over Hiroshima. It exploded 2,000 feet above ground over a metal, medical clinic, as irony would have it, as dark irony would have it, at two seconds after 8.16 a.m. Temperatures at the epicenter of the explosion reached 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit. The impact, of course, was devastating. Uh, those who were within a mile of the explosion were uh, carbonized, were uh, instantly burned to cinders by the extreme heat of the explosion. And there are a number of, uh, of photographs that show uh, those who had been, those who had been uh, carbonized by the explosion left uh, sinister shadows 
on the hard ground behind them. So we have uh, many photos of um, Japanese man carrying a cart, another man standing on the steps of a bank, uh, many other civilians who were immediately gone from the explosion but who left these shadows, other people who held up their hands to shield themselves from the explosion left patterned uh, sunburn on their faces uh, as well. In fact, those were the lucky ones. Uh, I think it's safe to say those who were somewhat outside the immediate epicenter of the blast suffered horrific burns. Uh, many of them attempted to uh, go into any body of water that they could find into uh, a river that ran through the city to try to uh, cool themselves off. Of course, their, their fate was terrible. Uh, the what medical services existed still existed outside the city um, after the explosion were quickly overwhelmed and these people would die terrible deaths and of course many of those who did survive the immediate aftermath of the blast would die of uh, radiation uh, after effects uh, in the months after the after the explosion so we don't know exactly how many were killed in the immediate explosion. The estimates vary widely. Uh, I've heard everything from 40,000 to 70,000 to 100,000. It's clear that by the end of the year though, 140,000 people had died uh, as a result of the Hiroshima explosion uh, with many, many tens of thousands more to die over the years that followed. Now, what are we to make of Hiroshima? Obviously, this is an extremely sensitive topic. Uh, so let's, let's focus on what we know very briefly, and then we can discuss it further in the question and answer, and my colleagues will discuss it as well. We do know that immense suffering uh, was dealt to the people of Hiroshima, both during the blast and immediately after the blast. Uh, we do know, however, as well, that this blast, as well as a detonation at Nagasaki on August 9th, ultimately ended World War II and obviated the necessity that everybody expected that the United States, as well as allied nations, would have to invade the home islands of Japan uh, with terrible suffering. The, the assumption was up to a million casualties, both for the invaders and many, many millions of deaths more uh, for the Japanese people themselves, both from the invasion as well as starvation and disease that would result afterwards. And I would just end with a couple of anecdotes. I've gonna, done a few of these webinars on Hiroshima and I found it interesting, some of the people who sent in their comments. One was a uh, docent at the Smithsonian Institution who said when uh, they were doing their exhibit on the Enola Gay, uh, one gentleman came in and said that he was um, a, uh, would have been a Japanese kamikaze pilot um, and would have died had it not been for the Hiroshima, Hiroshima bombing and that he counted this bombing as having saved his life. So I thank you all for your attention. I am now going to turn it over to my colleague, Larry DeCurris. All right, thanks, Ed. Um, Today I'm going to share with you some of the uh, associated artifacts we have on exhibit in the galleries at the National World War II Museum. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, so the, the first collection I have here is insignia and dog tags from General Leslie Groves. As uh, Ed had mentioned, uh, Leslie Groves oversaw the uh, Manhattan Project. Now, a little background on General Groves. He was a 1918 graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, uh, and he served over 20 years in the uh, regular Army uh, before his career really took off. So in 1940, he was still a captain, which uh, wasn't unusual at that time, but he was picked to uh, oversee this 
<clears throat> program to build training facilities for this massive expansion of the army that was about to take place. Based on his success in that role, he was assigned to what would become the Pentagon project, uh, where he would uh, be tasked with overseeing the construction of over half a million square feet of office space designed for uh, the War Department's 40,000 uh, staff members. And then from there, of course, he was assigned to the Manhattan Project. So you can see his dog tags here, the uh, engineer branch insignia and the quartermaster branch insignia. Now, during, uh, while uh, running the Manhattan Project, he also uh, remained uh, in charge of the Pentagon program so as to not uh, arouse suspicion. Now here we have a piece of Trinitite. Now, the result of the uh, atomic explosion at the Trinity test site, New Mexico in July of 1945, uh, resulted in, in the sand, sands of the desert being turned to glass. So uh, Trinitite's also known as Alamogordo glass. Um, and uh, samples of, the, of this material would have been available to collectors uh, in the late 40s and the early 50s. I believe they were selling this material in rock and gym shops for collectors. But uh, in 1953, the, the Atomic Energy Commission cleaned up the site and, and buried all this material. Now here we have a certificate of participation for one of the nuclear physicists who worked on the Manhattan Project, uh, a man by the name of Dr. Frank H. Shelton. Now, after the war, he became technical director for the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, uh, where he would again work for his old boss, uh, General Leslie Groves. Now he was responsible for developing military requirements for these atomic weapons and of course, conducting tests of those weapons. And if you look at the date on this certificate, I find this really interesting. It's dated August 6, 1945. So they literally wasted no time uh, make, making public knowledge of the men who, who worked on this, this program. This is the collection from uh, the lead bombardier on the Manhattan Project. Uh, a man by the name of Captain David Simple. Now, uh, he participated in dozens and dozens of uh, test drops um, as they trained up for this, this atomic bomb mission. Now, the uh, little boy atomic bomb, I think weighed about 9,000 pounds. So a lot of uh, dummy bombs were constructed using concrete um, and, you know, this aircraft immediately letting loose of 9,000 pounds, it, it definitely affected the characteristics of the aircraft. So uh, Simple uh, trained the, the men who flew the Nagasaki and the Hiroshima mission. And uh, unfortunately, he was killed in a uh, B-29 crash in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1946. Some of these items here, you see the Manhattan Project uh, shoulder insignia. Now, the uh, insignia in the what looks like the cloud is the Army Services, Army Service Forces insignia. Uh, and you see what looks like the shape of a question mark, uh, this lightning bolt, uh, which is actually splitting an atom. So this patch wasn't used. Uh, or this insignia wasn't adopted until after the cat was out of the bag, so to speak. So it's not until August of, uh, I'm sorry, August 20th of 1945 that this shoulder sleeve insignia becomes official. Now here's one of the, I think, the, the neatest artifacts we possess here at the World War II Museum. This is the watch worn by Colonel Paul Tibbetts during the Hiroshima mission. Now the band you see on the watch, he had that done after the mission. Um, so it's a cuff, aluminum cuff band. And uh, he has the 20th Air Force insignia uh, target and uh, date 
of the mission. Um, Colonel Tibbetts, I mean, he was literally um, at the forefront of the war since the beginning. Um, Colonel Tibbetts actually flew the very first uh, U.S. daylight mission against Rouen, France in August 1942, where they attacked railroad marshaling yards. Now, this very well could have been the watch he wore on that mission as well. So this is a, a artifact that kind of bookends the air war. Um, and we also have the flight record of Colonel Tibbetts as well. Now, this is a page from his record from August 1945. Uh, if you look at the, the first line on there, so there's August 6th and the aircraft type he flew, B-29. And two columns over, you see the duration of the mission. So that, that was a 12-hour and 15-minute mission that was flown that day. We also have a couple items from the co-pilot of Eno Legay, Captain Robert A. Lewis. Now, Lewis kept a log during uh, the mission. Now, uh, he hung on to this log post-war, but, but he wanted his children and his wife to have a copy. So he, he created six copies of this uh, log book and we have one of those copies. We also have his true airspeed computer that he used on the mission that day. We do have a couple of items from the, the Nagasaki blast that was recovered by, by uh, sailors who went ashore there. Um, here you see some uh, little bottles that, that were melted by the tremendous heat of that blast. And we have a vase. Now this vase probably would have been uh, in the outer perimeter of the blast. You can see uh, the side of the vase that was facing the blast is, is charred and the other side is, looks as if nothing happened. So that's, that's the end of my presentation. I'll, I'll go ahead and turn this over to uh, Kristen Burton. All right, thank you to Larry and thank you to everyone who has tuned in today for uh, this com uh, program of commemoration. Uh, I'm specifically going to be speaking about ways people can teach this event in history, which is not an easy topic to teach, but it is a required one. Teachers in the United States have to meet certain standards and for the atomic bomb it does fall under uh, the national history standards for era 8 standard 3b so this is something that teachers have to address at some point in their classes if adhering to these national history standards and it is complicated and it doesn't bring up a lot of different viewpoints and it is a popular point of debate and oftentimes, and there's a number of lesson plans developed around the prospect of debating whether or not Truman should have made the decision that he did. Uh, this is a common teaching tool when discussing the atomic bomb, should Truman have made the decision or not. The thing with teaching the history of the atomic bomb this way is it encourages students to engage with counterfactual history or what if history. What would have happened if Truman made the decision not to use the bomb? And while there is a time and place for counterfactual histories, I argue a history classroom is probably not the best place for it because ultimately Truman made the decision, the United States dropped the two bombs and Japan ultimately surrendered. So in a classroom setting, there's plenty to discuss and time is often so short to cover not only the history of World War II, but also hitting all of those required points uh, to meet those teaching standards. So to me, why take time away from discussing what did happen and engage with notions of what if? So I wanna share with you a few of the curricular materials produced by the National World War II Museum that can help you to teach this history, but also look beyond the decision. Uh, look 
pass the fact that Truman did make this decision. And you certainly can use this as a point of debate and discussion, but there's much more to this history than Truman making the call in the United States dropping these two bombs. There's the Manhattan Project, as Dr. Lingle presented in excellent detail. We have some educational materials that can help you to teach your students about the Manhattan Project and the complicated history that surrounds nuclear science. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'll show you a few of the materials you can access for free uh, if you are a teacher and you can register at our website, www2, the number two, classroom.com. Now, when you go to www2, sorry, .org, and when you go to www2classroom.org and you come up here, this is the landing page you'll see, you'll see curriculum guides. And if you click that, go to the home front and you're gonna find an entire volume of educational resources centered around World War II and the home front that you can use to teach in the classroom. Included in this volume are lesson plans and essays, as well as timelines, uh, chronologies, and glossaries surrounding the Manhattan Project. Here is an example of one of our lesson plans. And this looks specifically at the individuals who participated in the Manhattan Project. And the Manhattan Project, as Dr. Lingle pointed out, was massive in scale. It cost uh, billions of dollars and over 100,000 different people from across the world came to the United States to work on the Manhattan Project. But many of them had no idea what they were even working on. Of course, certainly some did, but that wasn't the case for everybody. So this lesson plan allows you to teach about the Manhattan Project and the individuals who participated in it, uh, while also checking off Common Core standards, national history standards, and giving students a glimpse into the actual manufacturing process of the atomic bomb. And as you can see here, these lesson plans come with step-by-step -step procedures, things you should look for in assessment, as well as extension and enrichment assignments you can assign for additional homework. Uh, and this here comes with primary source quotes uh, from people who participated in the Manhattan Project, courtesy of the Voices of the Manhattan Project via the Atomic Heritage Foundation. Um, and there's another lesson plan here, but there's also uh, essays that you can use. And I'm just gonna scroll down very quickly because it comes at the bottom of uh, the other home front materials. And you can see here an introductory essay. And this looks at the manufacture of the atomic bomb, the history that Dr. Lingle covered in detail, but it comes in a format that is uh, written at a high school grade level that you can assign to students. It gives your students the background to this early history of nuclear science, how, uh, the discovery of fission came about, how that fed into the formation of the Manhattan Project, and ultimately culminating in the Trinity test. And we have images here that you can share with your students. Now, uh, in addition, I mentioned that there is a uh, little page of biographies. You can see who different important players in the Manhattan Project were. There is also a glossary. And if you open up the glossary, you will notice to the side this fallout symbol next to a few of the terms. Each term that has that fallout symbol has a corresponding video element to help you teach your students a very complicated part of the history. So for example, chain reaction is a glossary term. If you scroll down to the video section of this uh, website, and it has no sound, but you will see a brief video of a minute in length that breaks down what a chain reaction is. And you can share this with your students and help enhance the teaching of the overall science that went into this broader history. So that is one element you can use to help teach uh, what, the, uh, what the atomic bombs even were and the technology and science behind them in addition to helping to explain the significance of the sheer uh, unprecedented power that came about through use of these weapons. 
Now, we also do have in our Pacific Theater volume um, lesson plans and essays that look specifically at use of the atomic bombs, the decision that went into it. This is an important topic. I don't want to downplay the importance of the decision made by President Harry Truman when he made the call, we're going to use these atomic bombs. So you can look into it, but do so in a way that is grounded to actual events in history. Because again, we can speculate all we want, but we only know what happened. We can only analyze specifically actual events in history. And you will see in these lesson plans, online resources that pair with them, um, an excellent oral history. And I wanna just end on that note in particular, uh, that you can use to help teach, uh, again, individual perspectives about the use of the atomic bombs is through our oral history collection, which is something that is very strong and, and something we're incredibly proud of. And I won't play it here, but you can access it uh, for free through the www.classroom.org website. It's about a three and a half minute clip. Physicist Lord Lawrence Johnston discusses his time working on the atomic bomb and more importantly, witnessing the Trinity test that occurred on July 16th, 1945. Um, and in addition to this, and something else you can use to uh, help teach your students about the decision that went into uh, bombing, making, to make the decision to drop two bombs, atomic bombs on Japan, is these maps. So you can look at what would have been an attempted uh, invasion of the Japanese home island. And uh, we also have maps that look at the extent of firebombing campaigns uh, to show the level of devastation that went into, that or preceded uh, the decision that Truman ultimately made to use the atomic bombs. Because it's important for us to remember the broader context, the historical context that went into this moment of decision. Uh, that for months, the United States had been engaging in uh, highly destructive firebombing campaigns across the Japanese home island. And yet, even after all of the death and destruction that came from those campaigns, Japanese leaders still continue to refuse to surrender. So there are a lot of elements that go into the teaching of this history, but to fully encompass perspectives that fall on both sides of these significant events, uh, excellent resources to include, to capture the perspectives and experiences of people who lived through that moment um, of bomb, the atomic bomb, little boy detonating over Hiroshima, is a book called Hiroshima by John Hersey. It came out in 1946. So the year after this event occurred, John Hersey was a journalist who interviewed six survivors of the bombing of Hiroshima. And it was originally published in American newspapers and then later compiled into a book published and it's never gone out of print from 1946 to today. And it is an excellent teaching tool that you can use. Um, I will say one more book uh, that you can use to capture perspectives, a book called uh, Sakiko. It is the story of a Nagasaki bomb survivor story and it's specifically from the perspective of a six-year-old boy who survived the bombing of Nagasaki. So these are excellent tools you can use to teach what did happen rather than focusing on potential counterfactuals and what could have happened uh, because the moment is of such significance that it is best to, I would argue, best to teach what did occur rather than what could have happened or what might have been. So thank you very much for your time. And with this, I'm gonna hand it back over to Dr. Rob Satino, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that may come up. Uh, hello again, everyone. Actually, we're all happy to answer any questions you may have. Looking at our timeline right now, we have a good 15 minutes and we have a lot of good questions in the queue. Um, I'm gonna moderate the, uh, the Q&A if, if my colleagues don't mind. And, and Larry, I wonder if I can kick one of these questions over to you for starter. Um, Paul Lester noted, Captain Shelton's date of birth shows 1924 in notes alongside his certificate of service. 
That means he was only 19 or 21 when he had such heavy responsibilities in the Manhattan Project. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. So he, he was a young guy. I mean, uh, across the board with, with, with everything involved in this project, you look at uh, Colonel Tibbetts. I mean, when, he, he, when that command's handed to him, he's 28 years old. And when he uh, flies the Hiroshima mission, he's 30. So, um, yeah, an enormous amount of responsibility for, for uh, what we would consider very young people today. I, I, if I've learned anything, I'll, I'll just piggyback on Larry. If I've learned anything working at the museum for the last four years, just celebrated my anniversary, it's how young uh, the people who fought World War II for. My father was in World War II and he always seemed plenty old to me. But when I come here and I look at the photos that we have on our wall, you realize very often this is a 19, 20, 21, 25 year old, or, you know, y young guy really with a piece of, you know, $2 billion technology, lugging around a piece of $2 billion technology. It, it really is something. Um, this one I think is probably for Ed, but, but again, these are, I'll just throw them uh, open to anyone. Anthony DeJoya asks, how much did the Soviet entry into the war on August 9th contribute to the Japanese decision to surrender? It's a little long. So would it have been possible to wait a few weeks to see if the Soviet entry led to surrender before our planned invasion? Do you believe the U.S. desire to keep the Soviets out of Japan proper contributed to our decision to drop the bombs? Anybody can oh. take that, but Ed, why don't you start? Yeah, that's great. I'll, I'll start by just a very quick comment on the previous question. Uh, many of the, in fact, the majority of the scientists who worked at Los Alamos were also quite young. These were like fresh out of graduate school, young PhDs. So that was true across this process. So the, um, the Soviet invasion of uh, Manchuria definitely came as a shock to the Japanese. Uh, I don't think that, however, it was a primary factor in the Japanese decision to uh, surrender. Uh, I think the concern of uh, extended atomic bombings, which seemed very possible, was more likely to be central to the Japanese decision. I also don't think, although in here I've changed my mind a little bit, uh, circumstantially, if you look at it from the outside, uh, it would seem that the desire to keep the Soviets out of Asia uh, was a motivating factor in Harry Truman's decision to drop the atomic bombs. However, research really shows that that was not a factor. Uh, it was not an issue in, in his decision. It was much more the primary factor was the decision not to, uh, I mean, the, the desire not to launch an invasion of the Japanese home islands, which would have, which would have been devastating from every point of view. So certainly the Soviet invasion is important. The Soviet invasion was, was a shock to the Japanese, but it wasn't a deciding factor. I've often thought that it was the emperor who had to be shocked into surrender. And I, I think but, for the emperor, the notion of, of, the, of the atomic bombs might have been the crucial shock to his own psyche that, that actually led him to, to make the decision. This no doubt will be chewed over by historians for, for time immemorial as it's been now for decades. Um, we have a question from Frederick Chang, uh, actually a couple of them and they're both good, so I'm gonna go with both of them. Were there third, fourth and additional atomic bombs ready to be dropped on further targets in Japan? There was an, another atomic bomb on the way uh, to Tinian and the, the capacity of bomb production had reached the point where they could have produced another bomb every four to six weeks. Uh, and that was something that, that was definitely considered. Uh, in fact, there, there were those who argued that a third bomb should have been dropped immediately after Nagasaki. Uh, and it would have been possible to deploy it within a week or two, had weather not intervened. You know, Larry, I, I heard your, uh, your program not too long ago about Operation Olympic, the, the invasion that didn't happen in November, the invasion of Kyushu. That was, that was scheduled to include nuclear weapons, was it not? Yes. That, that's that's the, that's the rumor. Uh, Marshall knew there were going to be seven additional atomic bombs available around that same time period. So uh, it just goes to show you how ignorant they were of, uh, you know, the nuclear fallout. But they, they were going to soften up the beaches of Kyushu with seven of these atomic bombs and then send our troops in two weeks later. So... <laughs> Wow, that's one of the, um, you know, the, the, we talk about the what ifs of history, and that's a what if that I think we're all glad did not happen. Um, 
Kristen, you know, you were mentioning about, about what ifs and counterfactuals in class. Counterfactuals on the university level, of course, is where most of us live. It's a, it's a big part of advanced graduate study. You know, um, we did have a comment from a Paul Lester who said, you know, he, he, so he says that although what if questions may be beside the point in a history class of, of what in fact occurred, Truman had to consider in advance what the objections were to dropping the bomb. So it seems to Paul, at least, to be legitimate history to study the thought processes and options. I just thought I'd give you a chance to comment on that if you'd like to say anything about that. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm not at all saying that we as students and as educators shouldn't consider all of the factors that went into the decision making process because it was a point of debate at the time as well. There was debate that fed into Truman's ultimate decision. Um, so there's certainly factors and uses for counterfactual histories. What tends to happen, however, is when people teach these histories, it's a, well, what would have happened if the U.S. didn't drop the bomb? Or say, and I did see in the Q&A, people say, well, if Japan dropped, had the bomb, would they have dropped it against the United States? And it's ultimately at a point, you're, it's pure speculation. And as historians, we base our arguments in documented facts and things that did occur. So look at the debates, look at all of the factors, look at the individuals in Truman's cabinet and his advisors, the points they were bringing to the table, everything that Truman took into consideration that fed into that decision, because there was speculation that fed into that decision inherently. They were dealing with something that had never been used in combat before. So this is something that can be a part of the educational experience. I just am cautious of teachers too often moving into the realm of what essentially becomes historical fiction at a certain point, because Truman did make that decision, the bombs were dropped, and we know what happened in the aftermath, and that in and of itself was such a significant point in history that, especially at the high school, junior high and high school level, so much of history education is focused upon what occurred, what happened, right? Um, and as Dr. Satino said, when you get into higher education levels, then you can speculate in greater detail and critically analyze other possible outcomes as a way of understanding in a better sense of what did occur. Uh, at the high school level, that's not quite uh, where, where teachers are focused. That is not the uh, objective of um, meeting the teaching standards. So instead of proposing these what if histories for students to understand this moment of dropping the bomb, we understand what occurred. Let's dive into those events in greater detail and, uh, and learn why this moment was so significant in changing the trajectory of world history. That's- you know, I, I've I, often had, yeah, that's, I, think you, I, I think you make a very good argument. I, in, in my own university uh, courses, I, I've often you know, had students write counterfactuals like, tell me a different way World War II could have ended. But then I also find myself having to say things like, no alien invasions, right? We have, we, we have, to, we have to be, no alien invasions, that's a good one. No, Hitler had a change of heart. And th those two things just very unlikely to have happened. And so one finds oneself when you are just even on the university level discussing alternate histories, you, you do have to, I think, put some delimitations, you know, reasonable scenarios. Um, Ed, I believe this one is uh, directed to you. It's Andrew Jones. Can you expand on the comment that the German program stalled in 1942, which is, I think, something that you said? Yes, it's, it's a very interesting subject. Uh, the, the German program stalled in 1942, just at the moment when the German scientists involved in leading their atomic weapons program felt that they had reached a breakthrough. The, the Germans had become much more focused, not to get into too much technical detail, on heavy water uh, as opposed to, to graphite as a neutron moderator. So they had taken a somewhat different approach to it. But the major problem that the German scientists had was in reaching Adolf Hitler and the Nazi hierarchy. Uh, the first attempts to try to bring their discoveries to the attention of of Hitler and, and his cronies uh, really fell flat. But finally, in the, I think it was in July of 1942, uh, there was a conference in Berlin in which, um, in which uh, Speer was present, in, in which uh, Ferdinand Porsche was present, uh, in which a number of others were present. And uh, Speer definitely was 
surprised and also intrigued by the discoveries that the German scientists had made. And he wanted more information. He wanted to know whether this was something to bring to Hitler or not. Um, but the, I'm sorry that I'm blanking right now, the, the German scientist who was leading that program. Werner Heisenberg? Yes, Heisenberg, thank you. Uh, had a sudden, we, we don't quite know why he changed his tune, but at, just a, after this meeting where he said we'd reached a breakthrough, we can develop these weapons, Speer asked for more information. Heisenberg said, well, actually, first of all, I'm not sure if we can do it. And second, there's a danger that an atomic detonation would be ever expanding and would destroy the globe. And when Speer brought that to Hitler, Hitler kind of laughed it off. And Speer said that Hitler was not, was it not intrigued by the idea of the world that he aspired to, to conquer being turned into a glowing star. Uh, and he laughed off the scientists as being idiots. And that was pretty much the end of it. We don't know whether it was because Heisenberg really had doubts or whether he suddenly had a fear of putting this weapon in Nazi hands. There were a lot of different reasons for it, uh, but it did founder that. I want to read a, a comment, actually not a question, from John Schild Connect. Uh, John says the following, my students always try to introduce alien invasions when we discuss alternative history. I teach 11th grade US history, so it's good to see it's not just my classes. But let me just say, John, it goes up, it goes up and down the spectrum of higher education well into the graduate ranks as well. So thank you, uh, thank you for that. Um, technologically speaking, Gary Hellman uh, uh, asked, how different were the two atomic bombs? I, by the way, this is a good question and it gets asked all the time and I don't think yet there's general knowledge on this point. How different, technologically speaking, were the two atomic uh, bombs? Were different teams assigned to creating the two? Was there competition between the teams? Was one bomb considered a better weapon? And so on and so forth. So anyone who'd like to comment on that? That's a great, a great story and a great question. Uh, very briefly, they were technologically very different because the question was, there were two different types of bombs. One was uranium-235 based, which was a little boy design, and the other was plutonium based, and plutonium was a new element. U-235 was somewhat slightly more stable. It was easier to use in a conventional style bomb, uh, and thus little boy was fairly, fairly relatively easy to design and manufacture. However, plutonium created all kinds of problems very unstable and it was a scientist named Seth Niedermeyer who was one of these young PhDs working at Los Alamos who came across the idea of instead of developing an explosive device using an implosive device, an implosion device that would actually compress plutonium inward and cause it, that's why I always say detonate rather than explode when it comes to uh, the Fat Man device at, at Nagasaki. Uh, it took quite a while for his idea to be accepted by the ordinance experts. Uh, Edward Teller, a fascinating figure if there ever was one, was central to developing the, the uh, implosion plutonium device. And in fact, it was that, that design which partly led to the research leading to thermonuclear weapons or the hydrogen bombs that would be developed after the war. So there were, there were different teams working on them. I don't know that they competed with each other, but uh, they were under different pressures and working with different technology. And I'll just add to that as well, that uh, the different Manhattan Project sites were designed for specific construction of the different kinds of bombs. Uh, and we act, an excellent teaching tool that I want to shout out as well is an electronic field trip that was produced last year by the distance learning team at the National World War II Museum, where they physically visited Los Alamos, Hanford, and looked at the different uh, equipment and technology that went into the manufacture of plutonium bomb, versus a uranium-based bomb. And uh, they, they did have those very different detonation methods, gun trigger for uranium, implosion for plutonium, and no one knew if it would work. It was all, it, it was all a big question mark. And there was a, some discussion and debate about running more tests, but the sheer cost of the elements that went into the manufacture of the bomb was so high that uh, General Grove said, no. No, we can't. We simply can't afford uh, to run more tests, and even more so, can't afford to have those tests fail. So, just for the record, the, the the Trinity test on July 16th was the implosion bomb. The 
the the the bomb that was on the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Today's anniversary was that as that uranium uh, two thirty five bomb, which which was sort of a gun style. You, you ram you, you shoot two pieces of uranium in, into one another, but it had never been tested under live conditions before it was dropped, uh, which is a, one of the amazing parts of this story. You know, um, the the clock on the wall sadly tells me that we're coming to the end of our hour together. Um, I, I'd ask anyone who's uh, interested in this general topic to move over to the museum's YouTube channel, where we will soon, uh, that is in, in four minutes at noon, be presenting a recorded interview that I conducted yesterday with uh, journalist Chris Wallace of Fox News, who's written a brand new book called Countdown 1945 about the final 116 days. It was an interesting interview, and I'm, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, that will be on, that will live on the museum's YouTube channel in perpetuity, long after we've all, shuffled, as I like to say, shuffled off this mortal coil, you'll still be able to see that. I wanna thank my partners in this round table today. I, just, I, I love working at the museum for a lot of reasons, but it's really the people with whom I work that, that makes it special. So I'll do that in order in which they spoke. That would be Dr. Ed Lengel, and that would be Larry DeFures, and that'd be Dr. Kristen Burton, um, and then Rob Satino here from the museum, bringing it home and saying, uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, go over to the YouTube channel if you're interested in more content with the Chris Wallace interview and have a great weekend. Bye from New Orleans.